Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history or society or our culture. Tonight we're going to start out with Paul Allen, who died recently at the age of 65. He was one of the co-founders of Microsoft and one of the country's leading philanthropists. To be on the forefront of a new technology like John D. Rockefeller or Henry Ford or Thomas Edison, you need three things. You need luck, brilliance, and vision. And Paul Allen had all three of them. He went to school at Lakeside Prep in Seattle along with Bill Gates. He was 14 and Bill Gates was 12. And they shared an interest in computers. And at the time, computers were these big hulking things that only corporations or the government had. In the early 1970s, Bill Gates went to Harvard. Paul Allen dropped out of Washington State and came to Boston to work at Honeywell along Route 128. And they stayed in contact with their shared love of computers and the emerging field of software. The first critical moment probably occurred at Harvard Yard when they saw a copy of the January issue of 1975's Popular Electronics talking about an Altair 8800 microcomputer. This was a completely new thing, this microcomputer, and it convinced Paul Allen to convince Bill Gates to drop out of Harvard and work on software for microcomputers. And from that, their company became known as Microsoft. They moved to Albuquerque, bought some software for an operating system called a disk operating system, modified it a little bit, and licensed it to the giant IBM, who didn't see that the real revolution was not in hardware, but in software. As I said, they leased it, they didn't sell it to IBM, and they were able to lease it to other companies and within 10 years, the Microsoft operating system created billionaires, and Paul Allen became the third richest man in the world. But things between him and Bill Gates got a little testy a little later on. Here he talks a little bit about his experience with Bill Gates on 60 Minutes with Leslie Stahl. When he was 15, I met a boy at his private school in Seattle, two years his junior, named Bill Gates. The two buddies revisiting an old computer lab where they used to feed their obsession with programming. And you lift me into the, one of those huge garbage bins. Bill and I would actually dive in the dumpsters to try to find listings of the secret inner code of the operating system You're and kidding. try to figure out how it worked. That's how passionate we were. They both became crack coders, but early on, Alan emerged as a creative dreamer, Gates, a cold-eyed pragmatist. When he was 13 years old, he told you, one day we're going to start a company, run a company. He was saying, well, imagine what it's like to run a Fortune 500 company. I'm thinking, I, I have no idea. You know, my parents were, were librarians. I mean, I would have 10 ideas, and he, and he would kind of pick them apart uh, one by one. One of Alan's ideas Gates didn't shoot down would lead to the personal computer revolution and launch Microsoft. It was 1974. He was a college dropout working in Boston, and one day he spotted a magazine announcing a new small computer called the Altair. He ran to show it to his friend Gates, then at Harvard. I said, hey, look at the magazine. This is the computer we've been waiting for. This is how the, the, the PC, the idea that we all have these computers, this is how it started. Yeah, and it's amazing to think back then Nobody had personal computers. I mean, there were computers in universities and research labs and in corporations, but nobody had personal computers. Alan's idea was to write software that would enable the Altair to work as well as those large computers. And so we called up the company that made it and said, well, we can demonstrate this software for you very, very quickly. Are you interested? And they said, sure, if you can really show up and demonstrate it. Did you have software? No. <laughs> you no. had nothing. We had nothing. So they spent the next eight weeks at Harvard feverishly writing code, but without an Altair to test on. Allen writes that because Gates looked like he was 13, they decided Allen should go alone to pitch their software. Sitting by an old original Altair, he showed me how he fed the computer a paper strip with their code punched into it and typed print 2 plus 2. And then, and then I have a term to sit in. And lo and behold, it printed four, and a wave of relief surged over me because I couldn't, I almost couldn't believe it had worked the first time. So that night I call Bill up and I say, Bill, yeah, it's unbelievable, it worked. We were just over the moon. It was the beginning of the age of a computer in every home on every desk. Almost overnight, people started buying these small computers and their software was in high demand. In 1977, Gates was even interviewed on a TV show. 
there's a lot of people who are forecasting that there'll be software stores just like the record stores today, and that there'll be thousands and thousands of those. And I think I'd have to agree with that. Allen writes that Gates had a rare gift for programming. He was also the shrewder businessman. From the beginning, he demanded a larger share of the company, 60% and then more. But Allen says he was the one who pushed through the company's big early break, developing an operating system for IBM's first personal computer in 1980. Yet, as the company soared, Allen didn't want to give up his whole life to Microsoft the way Gates did. Well, I've always had so many different interests. I think he was always pushing people to work as hard as they possibly could, maybe me more than, uh, than everybody else. You had to fight back intensely to stand your ground and make your, your position and your uh, convictions expressed. Alan was miserable and felt he was being marginalized. And then things got a lot worse. He got cancer. One night he passed by Gates's office and overheard him talking with Steve Ballmer, who'd been hired to help run the company. They were basically talking about how they were planning to dilute my share down to almost nothing. And it was uh, you know, really a shocking and disheartening moment for me. And, of course, Steve came over to my house later that night to apologize. But Bill didn't come. No, he sent Steve. He sent Steve. It wasn't Steve. He sent Steve. Well, Steve's the one who came. He got out of the day-to-day -day working of Microsoft, and he started to invest in other businesses. Most of them weren't successful. He went from the third richest man in the world to the 57th richest man in the world with some of his business failures. He developed a lot of patents, and he had a lot of wrangling with some of the other legal giants of the West Coast about those patents. In the Microsoft days, you had some great ideas and some great execution between me and Bill and many other people. You know, In technology, most things fail. Most companies fail. Uh, but I had some whoppers. Microsoft and Google, all these people have patents of their own. They all enforce patents. They all charge other companies for patents. And all I'm trying to do is, is uh, get back the investment that I made to create these patents. His greatest work post-Microsoft was for Seattle. He built a couple of museums, did a lot of healthcare charity, was probably the number one philanthropist in Seattle and may have seen to it that some of the tech giants stayed in Seattle with his real estate purchases. One of his museums in Seattle was the Museum of Pop Culture, and he said to do a very, very good Jimi Hendrix impression on the electric guitar. Ironically, his best post-Microsoft ventures might have been buying the Portland Trail Blazers basketball team and buying the Seattle Seahawks football team. They were threatening to leave Seattle before he bought them, and he turned them into a Super Bowl winner. Both of those investments increased the worth of those franchises by hundreds of millions of dollars. Bill Gates is synonymous with Microsoft, but Paul Allen had an awful lot to do with making that company what it is today. We're going to move on now to Earl Bakken, who died recently at the age of 94. Earl Bakken was the co-founder of the Medtronic Company, medical electronics company, and he was the inventor of the first portable battery-operated pacemaker. When he was in his 20s, he founded Medtronic, and it originally started out as a repair company for the University of Minnesota Hospital's electronics. The company's fortune changed overnight when Walt Lillehay, who was one of the great cardiac surgeons of the first half of the 20th century, is often called the pioneer of cardiac surgery, he had a young patient die during surgery. There was a power failure, and her large plug-in pacemaker failed. Dr. Lillehay asked Earl Bakken if he could create a battery-operated pacemaker. He did. Dr. Lillehay used it right away, and that put Medtronic on its way. They're now a multi-billion dollar corporation that makes some of the most important electronics for patients all over the world. Mr. Bakken left the company in 1976, moved to Hawaii, but he continued his philanthropic activities until his death. Here is WCCO Minneapolis to talk about Earl Bakken. Medtronic co-founder Earl Bakken turned his love of tinkering with electronics into the world's foremost medical device maker. He passed away over the weekend at the age of 94. Bakken's fascination with the original Frankenstein movie kindles his interest, and it would eventually lead to his development of the world's first cardiac pacemaker. As Bill Hudson explains, employees and patients are singing his praise. What began in a garage along this northeast Minneapolis block changed medicine forever. He was a pioneer and a visionary in a lot of ways. Earl Bakken was just a kid when he saw the original Frankenstein movie, setting the stage for what he'd devote his life to. He snuck into the Heights Theater in Columbia Heights 
and was really inspired by the concept of electricity within a human body being fundamental to life. At 25, Bakken co-founded Medtronic, repairing medical equipment. In the vault of this Minneapolis museum sits a microwave-sized plug-in pacemaker. Yeah, but it was his work with Dr. Lillehei at the University of Minnesota that really put him on the map. He'd create the world's first battery-powered cardiac pacemaker. Through the years, they got smaller, implantable, and today, barely the size of a pill. At his core, Earl was an engineer, and he believed in the value of what technology could do and what technology could do for humans. Medtronic today is the largest medical device firm making products to alleviate pain, restore health, and extend life. So that's a rallying mission for people, and then the notion of what technology can do to deliver on that, uh, that has guided us for the 60-plus for the years that we've been alive. For 40 of those, Earl Bakken was at the helm, building his company into a world leader. To make devices and provide services that are going to help restore people to full, active, productive, uh, better lives. So at Medtronic headquarters, lowered flags are signs of sadness. But there's also a celebration. You see it as a simple yellow rose laid at the bust in the museum preserving his genius. Bill Hudson, WCCO, 4 News. Well, I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer and IT genius, Sid Tepson. and we're going to close tonight with Juan Romero, who died recently at the age of 67. He is the subject of one of the most famous photographs in American history. He was a busboy at the Ambassador Hotel on June 5, 1968, after Robert Kennedy won the California primary. We talked about it before in other podcasts, and after Robert Kennedy gave his victory speech, he cut through the pantry and I'll let Juan Romero tell you what happened next. To introduce it, he talks about meeting Robert Kennedy the day before. They opened the door, and the senator was stuck on the phone. He put on the phone and says, come on in, boys. You could tell when he was looking at you that he's not looking through you. He's taking you into account. I remember walking out of there like I was 10 feet tall. The next day, he had his victory speech. So they came down the service elevator, which is behind the kitchen. I remember extending my hand as far as I could, and then I remember him shaking my hand, and as he let go, somebody shot him. I kneeled down to him and put my hand between the cold concrete and his head just to make him comfortable. I could see his lip moving, so I put my ear next to his lips, and I heard him say, is everybody okay? I said, yes, everybody's okay. I could feel a steady stream of blood coming through my fingers. I had a rosary in my shirt pocket, and I took it out, thinking that he would need it a lot more than me. I wrapped it around his right hand, and then they wheeled him away. The next day, I decided to go to school. I didn't want to think about it. But this woman was reading the newspaper, and you can see my picture in there with the senator on the floor. She turned around and showed me the picture and says, This is you, isn't it? I remember looking at my hands, and... There was dry blood in between my nails. Then I received bags of letters addressed to a busboy. There was a couple of angry letters. One of them even went as far as to say that if he hadn't stopped to shake your hand, the senator would have been alive. So I should be ashamed of myself for being so selfish. It's been a long 50 years, and... I still get uh, emotional, uh, tears come out. To honor Juan Romero, we're going to close with a song that the great Laura Nero wrote right after Robert Kennedy was killed, and we'll use the Fifth Dimension popular version of it. This is Save the Country. visit his grave in 2010. I felt like I needed to ask Kennedy to forgive me for not being able to stop those bullets from harming him. And I felt like, you know, it would be a a sign of respect to buy a suit. I never owned a suit in my life. When I wore the suit and I stood in front of his grave, I felt a, a little bit like the first day that I that I met him. I felt important, I felt American, and I felt good. <laughs>